matrices and vectors. That's what this course is all about. So this lesson is designed to sort of introduce some of the basic vocabulary involved in studying these objects. So what's the best place to start? The best place to start is just with numbers. So one of the important symbols we'll be working with throughout the semester is this fancy R. This fancy R refers to all real numbers. So these are all of the numbers you know and love that live on the number line. So the number negative two is a real number. The number zero is a negative, or is, is, is a real number. The number one is a real number. The number pi is a real number, so on and so forth. Now, um, one of the pieces of symbol, or what pieces of notation that will prove useful to us is this membership symbol. So that's this fancy E. So we use this fancy E symbol to indicate membership. So if I wanted to efficiently communicate that the number zero is a real number, I would write zero fancy E R. I write one fancy ER, negative two fancy ER, so on and so forth, to communicate that those objects are real numbers. Now it feels maybe a little bit silly to employ this notation, but keep in mind that there are plenty of things that people care about that aren't real numbers. For example, the word hello is a very commonly used word in the English language. Even though it's an important thing, it is not a real number, so we can efficiently communicate that by writing hello, fancy E, cross it out, R. So this uh, uh, notation allows us to speak or to write efficiently. Now uh, we'll often casually refer to real numbers as scalars. We use those terms interchangeably. So that's the building block upon which we will build lots of other uh, mathematical objects. Um, and the next such object is the notion of a vector. So in this course, when we use the term vector, what we really are talking about is a vector in R to the n. And what this stands for is simply a list of n scalars organized vertically into a list. So what you're looking at here are four examples of vectors. Our first one here is denoted by bold lowercase v. This is the vertical list of two scalars, that those scalars are one and negative two. The second vector is bold w. This one is organizing three scalars. Those are three, negative five, negative five. This vector bold x is organizing the list of four ones. And this vector bold v is organizing the list of negative seven ninths, zero, pi, and one. So these are all examples of vectors in r to the n. Now remember when we say r to the n, n refers to the number of scalars in the list. So once again, we use this membership notation. V organized a list of two scalars, so we say V belongs to R2. W is organizing this list of three scalars, so we say W belongs to R3. X is organizing this list of four scalars, and so is this vector B. So we could say X comma B both belong to R4. Note, however, that this vector V is organizing two scalars, not five. So this vector v is not a vector in R5. That's how we use this membership notation. Um, now, uh, if we're ever referring to the entries inside of a vector or the scalars inside of a vector, we will often use the term coordinates. So the scalars inside of a vector are called coordinates. Okay, so now on to the hero of the course, and this is the notion of an m by n matrix. By definition, an M by N matrix is an array of scalars organized into M rows and N columns. So here's our first example of a matrix in the course. What you're looking at is a grid of numbers organized into rows and columns. Now, this particular matrix is organized into one, or whoops, is organized into how many rows and how many columns? Well, it looks here like here we have four rows, one, two, three, four, and six columns, one, two, three, four, five, six. So um, because this matrix has four rows and six columns, we use the membership notation to communicate this by writing A belongs to R to the four by six. So when we write this, this time symbol doesn't mean multiplication, it's indicating number of rows by number of columns. In this case, we have four rows and six columns. Now, um, one thing that's important when you're working with matrices is that you're able to look up what each individual entry in the matrix is. 
Um, and when we do this, what we're talking about is the IJ entry of the matrix. So how do we navigate to the IJ entry of a matrix? The IJ entry is referring to the entry in the matrix that lives simultaneously in the ith row and the jth column. So here we have a perfectly good matrix. It looks like this one has one, two, three, four, five rows and one, two, three columns. So this is a five by three matrix. Let's say that I wanted to navigate to the four, two entry. Well, I use the notation capital A to refer to the matrix. So it's quite common to say, well, the four, two entry is notated by lowercase a sub four, two. Now, how do I get to this entry? I figure out where the fourth row is, one, two, three, four. And then I figure out where the second column is, one, two. There's only one number that is both in the fourth row and second column, and that number is negative two. So the four, two entry of this matrix is negative two. Okay, now when we're working with vectors and matrices, we'll want to do arithmetic with those objects. And today I want to introduce two types of arithmetic for both vectors and for matrices. The first type of arithmetic is called scalar vector products. The idea here is that if you give me any vector, I can multiply it by any scalar that I'm interested in. I have an example of how this works. The way we do this is coordinate wise. So here I am taking a perfectly good vector with three coordinates, that this, that's this vector, three, zero, four, and I'm going to scale it by the number two. Well, the way this works is we simply go coordinate by coordinate in the vector and multiply by two. So when I scale three by two, I produce the number six. The next coordinate is zero. Well, when I scale zero by two, I just produce zero. And the next coordinate is four. When I multiply four by two, I get eight. So we just go entry by entry in the vector or coordinate by coordinate in the vector and multiply by the, whatever scalar we're multiplying by. Note that when I scale this vector in R3 by the number two, I produce a new vector, but that new vector also has three coordinates. We also have vector addition. So if I have two vectors, each of which have the same number of coordinates, we add them together by matching up the coordinate positions and simply adding. So here I have two vectors, and these two vectors both live in R3. They have three coordinates. Well, how do I add them together? I go coordinate by coordinate and add everything up. Uh, the first coordinates of the two vectors are two and zero. Well, two plus zero equals two. The second coordinates are three and six, three plus six equals nine, and the third coordinates are seven and one, seven plus one equals eight. So I have two vectors, both with three coordinates. I add them together by matching the coordinates and adding, and when I do that uh, arithmetic, I produce a new vector that also has three coordinates. So it makes sense generally to write scalar times vector, so little c times a vector, bold V, and it also makes sense to write vector addition, bold V plus bold, bold W, if the C we used to scale was a scalar and the two vectors we're working with have the same number of coordinates. And the same principle applies to matrices. So I can take any matrix I want, regardless of the number of rows and the number of columns, and I can scale by any number I want. What I have here is a perfectly good three by two matrix, and I'm about to scale that matrix by the scalar eight. How does this work? I simply go entry by entry in the matrix and multiply by the number eight. The one one entry in the matrix is three, eight times three is 24. The one two entry of the matrix is four, eight times four is 32. The two one entry is six, eight times six is 48, so on and so forth. So when we scale a matrix, we can scale by any number we want. And the way this is done is we just go to all of the entries in the matrix and multiply by the scalar. We can also perform matrix addition as long as the two matrices we're adding together have the same number of rows and the same number of columns. So here I have two perfectly good three by two matrices. How do we add them together? We match up the entries and add. The one one entry of the first matrix is zero. The one one entry of the second matrix is one. Zero plus one equals one. The one two entry of the first matrix is seven and of the second matrix is zero. Seven plus zero is seven and I keep going entry by entry, matching the, core, uh, the entries up, adding, and what am I left with? Well, my original two matrices here are three by two matrices, 
when I add, I produce a new three by two matrix. So in this context, it makes sense to take any matrix A, regardless of the number of rows and regardless of the number of columns, and scale by a scalar little c. It also makes sense to add a matrix A to a matrix B, as long as those two matrices have the same number of rows and the same number of columns. So there's a word of warning here. When we're adding two things together, we have to make sure they have the same shape. So on the left here, I have an archetype that might be tempting to try to do. Here, someone has attempted to add a vector that has two entries in it, or two coordinates, to a vector that has three coordinates. Well, that's illegal under our paradigm. We're only allowed to add two vectors together if they have the same number of coordinates. So this is not allowed under our framework. It also only makes sense for us to add two matrices together if those two matrices have exactly the same number of rows and exactly the same number of columns. Here, someone has done something forbidden. You cannot add a two by three matrix to a four by two matrix. So both of these archetypes are totally incorrect. It only makes sense to add things if the two things have the same shape. So you have to be careful when you write something like V plus W or A plus B, because implicitly when you write that, you're assuming that the two vectors have the same number of coordinates or that the two matrices have exactly the same number of rows and the same number of columns. Okay, so I want to now introduce some operations that we conduct on matrices. Uh, so our first operation here is a very simple operation but it's astoundingly important. And this is the operation of transposition. So what is the transpose of a matrix? By definition, the transpose of a matrix is what is formed when we interchange the rows and the columns of that matrix. Now the notation we use here is this superscript T notation. This stands for A transpose. The best way to illustrate this is through an example. So what I have here is a matrix A this matrix looks like it has four rows and three columns. Now, how do we transpose the matrix? We interchange the roles of the rows and the columns. Here's how I like to do it. I go to the first row of the matrix that I'm starting with. That first row of my original matrix becomes the first column of the transposed matrix. Then I go to the second row of my original matrix. That second row of the original matrix becomes the second column of the transpose. The third row of the original matrix becomes the third column of the transpose, so on and so forth. So um, one way to algebraically communicate this is to simply declare that the ij entry of the transpose of a matrix is the ji entry of the original matrix. Now, another thing to note is that when you transpose, you change the size of your matrix. In this example, we started with a four by three matrix, but because we interchanged the roles of the rows and the columns, when we transposed, we produced a three by four matrix. So in general, what happens is that the transpose of your M by N matrix is always an N by M matrix. So to transpose, change the roles of the rows and the columns, this changes the size of the matrix. It's a very simple operation, but it's actually incredibly surprising how useful this is at, at lots of points throughout the course. So this is this operation is going to follow us throughout the entire class. Now, one reason this is useful is purely for an aesthetic reason. When I'm writing something, it is often the case that I have a limited amount of vertical space, yet I want to talk about vectors with lots of coordinates. Well, if you think about it, a vector is nothing more than an n by one matrix. And so what I can do is I could write that matrix as a row and then include the transpose superscript to indicate that what I really mean when I'm talking about this row is this row interpreted as a column. This accomplishes nothing other than it saves vertical space when we're writing. So if I don't have a lot of vertical space, I'll use this transposition notation in order to save vertical space when I'm writing vectors. Uh, I like to call this horizontal notation and we'll use it all the time. So get used to looking at these two expressions and thinking of them as exactly the same thing. The vector with coordinates nine, negative three, four, seven is the same thing as a matrix with a single row, nine, negative three, four, seven, with that has been transposed. 
Okay, now what when we introduce an operation, what we'll often do is we'll look at the um, rules that the operation obeys. And one crucially important um, uh, a property of transposition is that it's a linear operation. When we use the term linear operation, what we mean is that it distributes. So let's say that I'm taking a scalar C1 times a matrix A1, and then I'm adding that to another scalar C2 multiplied by another matrix A2. And let's say that I want to take that whole expression and then transpose. Well, it turns out that all I need to do to do this is distribute the transpose sign to the individual two matrices, then scale and add together. So you're always allowed to distribute transposes throughout expressions that look like this. This will turn out to be very useful to us in situations where we're working with symbolic expressions. That'll happen a lot in this course. Um, another interesting property is this is our first encounter with what's called an involutive operation. The term involution means if you do the thing twice, you get back the original thing. So we've already seen that if you transpose a matrix once, the matrix changes. But if you transpose again, what happens is that the original uh, uh, rows became columns when you first transposed, but then be they become rows again when you transpose again. So this can be summarized in a single equation that says A transpose transpose is simply equal to A. Uh, we'll encounter other involutive processes throughout the course. Transposition by far though will be the simplest. Um, now once we have the tool of transposition, we can build one of the most important adjectives uh, that will develop throughout the course. And this is the notion of a symmetric matrix. Now by definition, we say that a matrix is symmetric if it is equal to its own transpose. So we say a matrix S is symmetric if S transpose equals S. Remember, if we transpose twice, we always get back the original matrix. But if we transpose once and don't change the matrix, that's a very special situation. And we reserve the term symmetric for that situation. Now let's get our hands dirty and look at a specific symmetric matrix. Here I have a matrix S, and this one looks like it's four by four. Now, if I look at the first row in the first column of this matrix, what I realize is that, is that they're exactly the same. The coordinates in the first row are negative two, 17, negative nine, and negative one. Those are exactly the coordinates of the first column. So if I were to rip out that first row and put it into the first column of a new matrix, I actually haven't changed anything. Um, if I look at the second row of this matrix, I realize that's exactly the same thing as the second column. The third row here is exactly the same as the third column. And the fourth row here is exactly the same as the fourth column. This is an incredibly special event. This, if you wrote down a matrix randomly, this would almost certainly not happen. But for this particular matrix, that's exactly what happens. So what's happening here is this is a special matrix. The transpose of this matrix equals itself. So we would say that this is a symmetric matrix. So at the end of the day, symmetric matrix means S transpose equals S. If you're working with a particular matrix, what that means is that the rows are the same as the columns. Now, if you're curious why we use this term symmetric and not some other term, what this is referring to is symmetry across the diagonal. Now, what is the diagonal of a matrix? This is all, these are all of the entries in the II position. So the 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 4, 4 positions cut um, from the upper left-hand corner down to the bottom right-hand corner of the matrix. Um, that's referred to as the diagonal of the matrix. If you look at a symmetric matrix, all of the entries above and below the diagonal match up. So the 17 is in the 1, 2 position. It pairs for the symmetric matrix with this 17 in the 2, 1 position. This negative 9 in the 1, 3 position pairs with this negative 9 in the 3, 1 position, so on and so forth. So all symmetric matrices end up looking like this, which is why we use the term symmetric to refer to the equation S transpose equals S. Now, the thing I want you to remember is S transpose equals S. All of the rest of this is nice to know, but it is not the definition of a symmetric matrix. Definition is S transpose equals S. The reason we use the term symmetric is because of the symmetry across the diagonal of our matrix here. And the last uh, in, uh, operation I want to introduce is this notion of trace. Trace is a very simple thing we do to matrices um, that are n by n. 
the trace of an n by n matrix is nothing more than the sum of all of the diagonal entries. So here I have an example illustrating the point. I have a four by four matrix, so that's an n by n matrix. If I want to take its trace, I look at the diagonal of the matrix. So that's the one, one, two, two, three, three, and four, four positions. And all I do is add those entries together. For this particular four by four matrix, I'm adding negative 12, negative 19, 14, and six. I did that arithmetic earlier and produced the number negative 11. So evidently, if I'm paying attention to the definition here, when I take the trace of an n by n matrix, I'm summing the scalars that are in the diagonal of the matrix. And what do I produce? I produce some scalar. So it's important to realize that the trace of a matrix is a scalar quantity. For this particular four by four, that scalar happens to equal negative 11. Now, um, how does trace behave? Well, it too, just like transposition, is a linear operation. Again, what that means is that I can distribute the operation. So if I find myself in a situation where I'm taking the trace of an expression that looks like this, a scalar C1 times a matrix A1 plus a scalar C2 times a matrix A2, what I can do is I can distribute the trace across the addition and across the scalars. So this is exactly the same thing as taking the trace of those two individual matrices, scaling them separately, and then adding things together. To illustrate this point, let's just uh, look at a specific uh, abstract situation. Let's say that I had two matrices A and B, and all I knew about them is that the trace of the matrix A was negative three, remember trace is a scalar quantity, and that the trace of the other matrix B is uh, the number five, again, a scalar quantity. Well, let's say that I wanted to look at the um, trace of some expression, six times A minus B. Well, I can use the linearity property or the linear property of the operation, operation of trace to distribute the operation across the expression. According to the property, this should be six times the trace of A minus the trace of B. Well, we said a moment ago that the trace of A was negative three and the trace of B is equal to five. So really what I'm calculating is six times negative three minus five. And if I do the arithmetic, I find that's equal to negative 23. So that's how the trace operation works. So that's our basic crash course in the vocabulary of scalars, vectors, and matrices, and also in the operations of transposition and trace. Uh, before I let you go, I want to call attention to um, the agenda item on the website where we're talking about matrices and vectors. And I want to click on this blue icon called Sage. Um, for uh, roughly every uh, uh, subject that we cover, I'll include a few calculators in the web page that might help you with a few of the more mundane calculations that we do in the class. Since this is our first lesson, I'll go a little bit more in depth here. Um, Sage is a computer algebra system written in Python. Now, if you've worked with Python before, a lot of the code you see here will be intuitive, but if you've never done any coding in your life, that's totally fine. This is not a coding course. I've pre-written everything you need, so you don't really have to interact with the code. Um, now, um, uh, this computer algebra system, Sage, is especially useful for working with things like scalars, vectors, and matrices. So I want to introduce you to a little bit of the syntax that we use when we define these objects in this language. So if you look at the first cell in the web page, you'll note that if you click in the cell, you can edit the code. There's predefined things here, but you can edit it if you like. The first thing I've done is I've just introduced you to the syntax for defining matrices. The syntax here, if you want to define a matrix A, is you say A equals matrix, open parentheses, open uh, square bracket, and then what you do is you list the rows in parentheses. So what I'm doing here is I'm defining a matrix A. This matrix has two rows, and each of those rows has three entries. So this should be a two by three matrix. The first row uh, consists of one, two, three, and the second row consists of four, five, six. Now you can, uh, so if you click evaluate here, the code I've written at the bottom will simply print out the definition of this matrix. Now note, if you want to, you can edit the code. If you append something, so if you say, instead of one, two, three, I want one, two, uh, negative seven, comma, uh, 19. And if you went to the second row, well, you'll have to add two things because we just added two things to the uh, first row of this matrix. Let's say you add zero, 
one, uh, or how about 2022, or sorry, 2022, because that's the year. And then let's say that maybe you wanted a third row. You could put comma, open parentheses, close parentheses, and inside of those parentheses, input um, uh, five numbers. One, two, negative seven, eight, uh, zero, perhaps. Um, so it looks now like I've adjusted the definition of A. This matrix should now have three rows and five columns. And if I've done everything correctly, when I click evaluate, it'll print out the new version of this matrix. Like we said, this should have three rows and five columns. Note, if you make a mistake, and uh, let's say perhaps you uh, input the wrong number of entries in one of the rows, this will be incompatible. So this is an invalid matrix. When I click evaluated, uh, the code throws an error. So I would have to go back and redefine the matrix if I wanted to work with that matrix. So a lot of these calculators, the way they work is I've predefined code so that you input your matrix and then maybe some other data and click evaluate and the calculator will spit out whatever you're interested in. Now, during our lesson here, we talked about adding matrices. To add matrices, you just use the expected notation, A plus B, once those two matrices are defined. We also talked about scaling matrices. If you want to do this, define your scalar, multiply by your matrix. And if you want to transpose, you can quickly do this in the syntax by writing dot capital T on your matrix. So here what I've done is I've uh, defined two matrices, A and B, and I'm printing out a few properties of those matrices. So here uh, I'm defining two matrices, A and B. They're both two by three matrices. So it is legal to add them together. A plus B is this new uh, two by three matrix. Um, it's also perfectly acceptable to multiply any matrix by any scalar. So if, for example, you wanted to multiply A by the number two, well, that just doubles every entry inside of the matrix A. And if you wanted to transpose the matrix, again, the syntax for this is A dot capital T, um, that reverses the roles of the rows and the columns. Our A here was two by three, so the transpose should be three by two. The new columns are the old rows. So the original rows were one, two, three, four, five, six. When we transpose, the new columns are one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, finally, um, uh, or I guess a few other things here. Um, if you want to take the trace of a matrix, you can use the syntax a dot trace, open close parentheses to do this. So here I've defined a, a, a three by three matrix. If we click evaluate, um, this prints out the matrix we've defined and then tells you the trace. So you can go in here and change the matrix A if you like. And, th and then if you click evaluate, the new trace will pop out. And um, uh, there is also a syntax for dealing with vectors. If you want to define a vector in uh, this language, you use the syntax vector, open parentheses, open bracket, and then list the coordinates. So here what I'm doing is I'm defining a vector with four coordinates, just one, two, three, four. So that's a vector in R to the four. And if I click evaluate, this code will just print out the definition of my vector. Note that in this syntax, when we're talking about vectors, unlike in class, um, this will just print out all of the coordinates one by one in a single row. From our perspective in class, a vector is a column of numbers. So be aware of that distinction. Um, and as expected, the syntax for scaling is just take your scalar and star to multiply by your vector. And if you have two vectors with the same number of coordinates, you can add them together. So the way this code works is I've predefined two vectors with four coordinates, V and W. Um, I can uh, add them together if I wanted, and I can multiply by any scalar if I wanted using the appropriate syntax. So play around with the calculator on the website to familiarize yourself with the syntax. The idea is that um, when you're working on problem sets, you should outsource the ugly calculations to um, the, uh, the Sage calculators. But when you're doing that in your problem sets, just make sure that it's clear that you did those calculations by writing something like did this in Sage or whatever in your problem set. So uh, 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 without further